Hello, everybody, and welcome to this session on Indigenous Voices. Um, I'm really excited for this one, so um, I hope that you will enjoy it. Uh, before we begin, um, I'm aware that we are, of course, situated on the lands of many different First Nations people. So I firstly invite you all to reflect on the lands that you're currently situated on and feel free to share that in the chat window. Um, I'm situated on currently the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And as such, I would like to acknowledge their deep history and their continuing contribution to this region. Um, and I'd also like to pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and extend this respect to the First Nations people joining us today from Australia, Aotearoa and around the world. Um, we'll be recording this session, so please keep your microphone and camera off, and that recording will be made available on the website in the coming week, um, if you'd like to share it with colleagues. We'll also be running a Slido for um, posing and voting on questions for the panel. Uh, for those who've not used it before, simply go to the website and put in the number that's on the screen, um, or you can click on the, lin uh, the link that's going to be added to the chat window now. Um, so with that, um, I'm happy to introduce the session and uh, looking at knowledge generation, stewardship and, and sharing from a, a First Nations perspective. Um, and it's being chaired by the excellent um, Kim Tyree. So I shall hand over to her now. Kim. No, my and Heidi my and welcome. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians or kaitiaki of the land on which you are standing today, their tupuna and komatua past, present and emerging, who never ceded sovereignty. Today we're going to hear from an illustrious panel of experts, all Indigenous researchers, and our topic is Indigenous Voices, Research Principles and Practice Through a First Nations Lens. Open scholarship is often viewed as binary, something is either open or closed. And as it says on the Global Indigenous Data Alliance website, the current movement towards open data and open science does not fully engage with Indigenous people's rights and interest. When it comes to Indigenous knowledges, there are layers of complexity around principles, permissions, sovereignty, ethics, intergenerational trauma, colonization, collective ownership and benefit, reciprocity, licensing, and so much more. Fortunately, today's awesome panel are all working in this space. We have Dr. Uh, Levon Blue from uh, QUT. We have Associate Professor Dr. Maui Hudson from University of Waikato and Associate Professor Spencer Lilly from Te Hiranga Waka Victoria University, Wellington. Uh, ko Kim Tairi Toku Ingoa, nai, no Waikato Oku Tupuna, ko Mona Totori Te Mona, ko Waikato Te Awa, he kaitaho puka aho ki te wānana aranui o Tamaki Makoto e mahi ana no reira, ki ora e ho mahi. Uh, I am Kim Tairi. Uh, my ancestors are from uh, where Spencer works at the University of Waikato, uh, from Waikato. Our mountain is Mona Totori, our river is the mighty Waikato, and I'm the university librarian at AUT. Uh, my role today is to keep the conversation flowing and ask questions of the panel. And I'd like to start with a short karakia or blessing. And this acknowledges our atua or tupuna. Uh, and creates a safe place for the sharing of knowledge. Rangi nui ki runga, papatu niku ki raro, kaputa te ira tangata, i te fei au ki te au maama, tuturu whakamaua ki a tina tina. Humie, humie, kia ora. So the karakia itself speaks about the Māori atua who were separated so that light and knowledge could come into the world of people and how together we can move forward with purpose united in that light and knowledge. And it's one of my favourites. So now I'm going to uh, pass to the panel for some introductions and then we'll get straight into some questions. 
So uh, we might start with uh, Levon uh, with your introduction. Thank you, Kim, and thank you for um, introducing the panel. Nimki Nebukwe, Wab Shoshan Dodan. Hello, my name is Levon Blue. I'm an Anishinaabe woman originally from Canada. I'm a member of the Bosley First Nations Chimnasing Band in Canada, and I have been I now live and work on the lands of the traditional owners, the Turrbal and the Yagara people in Queensland, and I wish to pay my respects to elders past and present as well. Thanks. Namihi, thank you for that, Livon. Uh, Spencer, would you like to go next? Okay. Uh, tēnā tata katoa, um, nā mihi nui ki a koutou, uh, e nā iwi a hui hui tata e te ahi ahi nei. Um, ko Spencer Lully, tako ingo, hei uri o te ati awa mua opoko in nā pui. Um, so um, Spencer Lully, I'm currently at Te Heringa Waka, which is Victoria University of Wellington in the School of Information Management. Um, I'm affiliated to Te Ati Awa, which um, has uh, various tribal territories in um, Taranaki, Wellington, where I'm based at the moment, and at the top of the South Highland, um, as well as more Opoko, who are um, based in uh, just two hours north of uh, Wellington, and uh, Nāpui, which is part of the top of the North Island and the biggest um, tribe in New Zealand. Um, so, kia ora, everyone. Thank you, Kim, for your introduction. Kia ora. And, Thanks um, for that, Spencer. And on to Maui. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, ina mane ngā reo, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, ko mā tātua te waka, ko whakatohia te iwi. Uh, so, kia ora everyone. Uh, my name is Maui Hudson. I'm a member. Uh, I was talking about the Whakatohia Nation. I've been hanging out with too many people from First Nations, and now I'm sort of talking about our Iwi and tribe as nations. I almost started talking about them as a kingdom the other day. So, <laughs> you know, as, as we get more rights, we start to kind of wield more power. But uh, yeah, mostly at Whakatoa here, and I work at the uh, Te Kote Research Institute at the University of Waikato, being um, involved with the development of Te Manararanga, the Māori Data Sovereignty Network, and the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, and that was um, largely of starting with conversations around research, and what was the right way of doing research, and then having to think about how do we deal with the data and the information that emerges from that process, so really happy to be a part of this um, session. Uh, with my colleagues on the panel, um, and thank you, Kim. Kia ora, namihi nui kia koutou katoa, thank you everyone. So on to our first question. So Api Salomi Mavono uh, recently said in an article that he published that within our Southern Hemisphere universities, Indigenous academics are still a minority and struggling to be heard. And what I'm interested in knowing from you is is open access part of the answer? Many believe that it is. So over to the panel, do you agree or disagree? Who'd like to start the conversation off? Oh, okay, <laughs> go Levon, go Levon. You look okay, like okay, <laughs> I'll say something. <laughs> um, I was going to say it's difficult to answer in some regards this question because um, being First Nation Canadian, I'm in Australia and therefore I can't necessarily comment very well in the Canadian context, um, but I can only share with you what I have certainly read and heard from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander academics about their experiences. And this is around the struggle to be heard and being a minority. I can also go to the stats and tell you that in Australia, certainly Indigenous academics, um, according to the 2017 stats, were, were definitely still a minority with only 423. Indigenous academic staff employed um, at universities around Australia. And with the majority of the Indigenous academics um, that were employed, that are employed, they're, they're overrepresented in the, the lower levels, in the associate level, which is a level A, or the lecturer level, level B. The stats also tell us that in 2017, there were 575 Indigenous um, higher degree by research students enrolled. And when you look at the population parity figures, knowing that 
Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people represent about 3.1% of the population, you'd need to have about um, 1,316, according to the stats, more Indigenous academics to, to reach um, parity. And in the HDR space, it's about 792 more Indigenous HDR students. So I think if you come, so certainly yes, a minority, uh, coming back to whether or not there's struggle to be heard, I think that's also very much dependent on the higher institution that um, you're employed at and, and whether or not um, Indigenous values are respect, Indigenous perspectives are valued and, and respected at that institution. The open access, I'll, I might leave that part of the question to my colleagues if that's all right. Okay. Great. I'll go, I'll go next if it's okay. Um, I, I think um, that question is, is very valid. Um, there's been a lot of work that's been done over the last few years here about sort of Māori and Pacifica um, uh, academics uh, in, in the university sector and, and, and the struggles that um, we have in terms of uh, getting uh, noticed and um, being uh, recognised for for what we could contribute. I think one of the um, biggest problems, though, is um, and I, I raised this in, in the discussions we've been having by email, is that over here it's very, very important that um, we get recognised um, for our research contribution and the, the key way for getting that recognition is by being uh, published in high ranking um, journals. And, um, and although there are some open access journals that do sort of rank very highly, um, actually finding the right journal in the right discipline at the right time um, is, is not always easy. Um, and so obviously there, there's greater advantages with going um, with something that belongs to a subscription model. Um, it will be more widely recognised. There's a number of benefits and disadvantages from publishing in any area. Um, and in some ways, it might be easier to get into an open journal than it is into um, something that is ranked much higher and is in a subscription journal, but um, whether we would get the recognition within our own universities is, is another question entirely. And um, the way that the PBRF, uh, Performance-Based Research Fund, for those that aren't from New Zealand, is um, we get assessed every six years on our research outputs um, and our uh, peer esteem. And so it's very important to you know, to have these very high outputs and um, open access isn't always going to be able to do that. Um, but I think at times, you know, where there is an open access um, opportunity should also um, to assess whether it's the right one at the right time. Sure, so I'll, I'll, I'll kick in with my thoughts. Um, one is, look, I support all the, the comments that have been made, and I think in, in some ways sort of run the same risk of conflating um, questions around open access and what it does in terms of visibility with challenges around power. And a lot of the, you know, the, the kind of the struggles around getting, um, and when I, when I listen to that kind of statement, it's a question of power and opportunity to have a voice. And the opportunity to have a voice in that space isn't the same as um, just making things open because um, openness is in lots of ways lends itself to access that's not necessarily a change in power and you're thinking about the then the use of that information that's being shared uh, in one way in a way that might be supportive of those indigenous academics in a visibility sense but in another way um, available for others to use in a way that might be thought of as misappropriation and I think this is where there's, um, uh, these sorts of ideas uh, might, you know, openness in certain instances that is, is useful and in other instances may be less so. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's 
I think power, the, the power thing is, is huge. And I know that particularly, uh, you know, within our universities, there's, there's real pressure to, for those rankings. And then, you know, deans push you in a certain direction when it comes to publishing, even if you are supportive of the kaupapa or the, you know, the idea around making your research more available, you still are kind of fighting against that, uh, you know, the ERA or, and the PBRF um, requirements from your institution. So we might move on to talking a little bit about principles and ethics. And um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Linda Two Fai Smith's seminal book, Decolonizing Methodologies in Research and Indigenous People. And it talks about a Kopapa Māori approach to researching uh, with and in Māori communities, which are prescribed in cultural terms such as aroha ki te tangata, so respect for the people, uh, kanohi ki tia, being seen in those communities. And uh, Maui has also co-authored uh, Te Ara Tika, which are guidelines for uh, Māori research ethics. And then we have the care principles and the fear principles. Uh, what I'm interested in knowing is, is there a, a set of first principles or kind of common shared principles across First Nations peoples that apply when working with Indigenous communities can there be such a thing? Um, and we might we might start with um, with Maui as director of Te Kotahi. Do, do your team work with a sense of principle a set of principles when you go out and do research with community? I say yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> is it is it a checklist? Probably not quite. <laughs> But, and and I think the thing is, you know, we um, sort of draw on all of those all of those things. So I think there's this, um, uh, you know, this is a sort of tension which we've got in some ways between um, being respectful of local protocol, and um, you know whether that's uh, for a particular area, or for, you know, for a particular community, and being able to be responsive in the way that they would like you to operate. So you know, a number of those. Um, principles which um, Linda spoke, um, spoke about was speaking about how you act in relation to them and and that if you're if you're embodying those kind of ideas or practices then you'll be respectful of the ethics which are kind of grounded in that local community now often as you think about your own um, sort of space of operating and you know think about Te Aratika you know the the sort of the four principles that were in place then was actually arose from just thinking about what would be some questions that communities would ask you if you went in to talk to them. And they'd be like, you know, where does this idea come from? What's the papa of this um, kind of question? Hey, why te mana, who's got the control? It's just about, you know, how do we kind of set this up in the right sort of way? And then Mawai Manaki, and that was more about you know how how the people's interests looked out for. So I think you know whether it's those principles, whether it's the care principles, whether it's these other things, they're supposed to support um, the way you, I guess, the way you operate in relation to that community themselves, but also as those things move away from the community. So, you know, it moves out of that context into a university context, into a, you know, some sort of open data environment. As you move out, you can't use the same community principles to inform it. So it's sort of, you can take the, the essence of it and try and work out how it relates to these other ideas that are informing these other spaces. Levin or Spencer, do you have anything to add? Um, I, I think what Maui was saying, um, you know, there's no one size fits all principle, really. Um, you really do have to know the community that you're working with, and it's that relationship building over time. Um, what, what, what we, that is um, that relationship building 
aspect is most important. And if you have a continued relationship with that community, there will be different ways that you interact with that community depending on what um, activities you're taking with, uh, place with them. I, I'm going to say you just can't take anything for granted that what works one time with that community will work the, the same way the next time. And um, so I guess it's, it's just showing, bringing those basic values to the table every time, um, but um, really listening to what it is um, they expect. Um, and so having that ongoing meaningful dialogue, dialogue I think it's, it's important. If I could just add to, um, it's very much connected to what both Mari and Spencer have said. I think in the research settings that I've had the um, privilege of working in, it's very contextually situational. So I was explaining to the other uh, the other day to a colleague how relational accountability, as described by um, Professor Sean Wilson, that's very applicable. To applicable to me when I'm working in the First Nations community in Canada that I'm a member of. However, in the research project, um, one of the research projects in Australia where we were working with um, Indigenous higher degree by research students, not so much because my relational accountability is really connected to my position in that role, whereas my, my relational accountability in the community setting it includes my ancestors and all my relations. So it's quite different. And it would, the way I would approach an ethics application would be, would be quite different as well. Um, and having put up ethics applications through to do research in both Canada and Australia, there are different sets of guidelines to follow. So in Canada, it's the Tri-Council um, and chapter nine deals with um, research with Aboriginal communities. And in Australia, so far, I've, um, uh, it's the NHM, NHMRC, keeping it on track. And re more recently, IATSIS has um, come up with a code of ethics. I haven't um, put an application in yet since the code uh, that IATSIS has developed has, um, has been published, but that would certainly be um, something I'd have to address in, in the application. Can I just um, just add a little bit too? You know the, you know, think about the key principles. You know, one of the the things there is, you know, ethics. And when it talks about ethics in that context, it's talking about, um, uh, it's really talking about um, operating in in line with sort of a local ethical protocols. And so those, as you sort of kind of scale out, whether it's you know sort of larger Māori research ethics or kind of more indigenous ethics things, they're often reinforcing the same sorts of ideas. And and so even though um, there's probably very few communities that have very really specific ethical um, kind of ethics protocols which you can read about and sort of understand before you go and get involved, these other ones. Um, get you closer to help you to orientate towards the sorts of behaviors you might expect to see even though you have to then be responsive to what those um, expectations actually are when you arrive there um, and I think that's probably where you see the difference between um, having to respond to or have some of the western kind of ethical ideals and then the ones that get articulated across the indigenous frameworks. Uh. Maui, I'm interested in what you said about the as the context shifts, you can't apply the same principles. So, I mean, one of the things that we do uh, as libraries is we have open access repositories where we put uh, Indigenous knowledges and research from our academics and students with a view to sharing more widely, and we touched on that earlier. Um, but we are also conscious that just because it's available and the research is done doesn't mean that we should be sharing it. So in terms of negotiating and having those conversations with the researchers themselves, what can the library do to support researchers? 
Uh, so, so I want to make a little bit of a distinction between um, both, uh, because there's there's a couple of couple of conversations. One is um, open access in relation to data, and data that's been collected. And I know you know there's been conversations here about data management policies within the institutions, and that um, kind of the raw data that's been collected should be available and openly accessible, whether that's for kind of you know, checking or reuse. There's a whole range of reasons why that's been promoted. And it's within, um, you know, a lot of kind of science circles where people are, uh, are taking measurements of things, then it seems like that's fairly innocuous to make that, that stuff more easily available. But as soon as you start talking about the social sciences, as soon as you start talking about kind of indigenous spaces, indigenous knowledge, um, the researchers get very anxious about being expected to provide that raw kind of content to make it available to others and it's you know and it's all about this uh, you know different people's um, i think the the sort of the relationship they have with the people that have provided that information um, that it sits within within that project and the things that then become the publication is the bit which you've sort of um, siphoned out and said that bit is okay to be shared and yet there's other bits that aren't so you know when i had a project i did with some traditional healers and you know i'd go into um our sort of hui and you know 80 percent of the conversation was them talking to themselves about their own stuff that <laughs> 20 percent might have been related to the to, to the research project and actually some of it was probably just for me and not the project and and so you have to sort of kind of decipher which is the bit that is being shared with you, which is to then be able to be shared with others. Mm -hmm. And and I think the I, I, this is where I guess that that sort of how that ethics process then translates into your processes within the library setting or, or the library or data management space that allow that that same sort of differentiation to be made and the right bits to end up in the right place. Mm -hmm clarifying that does anyone else have anything else to add uh, i think um you know really where the library's um main contribution comes is to be assisting researchers to identify the places where there's potential for publication and helping identify some of those um you know if we're interested in open access looking for um, viable places to go. Um, you know, there's a lot of predatory journals out there for a start that um, say that they're open access and, um, you know, they're, they're not very good quality um, journals at, at, at the best of times. Um, so I have one of the, um, being a former librarian, um, I was always um, hit up by my uh, colleagues um, at my last school um, asking me, is this a good journal? Is that a good journal? And yeah, you know, so, um, I was taking on those extra research consultation type activities that probably taking work away from my colleagues in the library, but it's that sort of assistance that can help. Um, Lindor um, on um, the chat said um, about uh, depositing um, copies of our work into the open repository. And I think it's helping academics understand what is possible there. Um, because most, most of the subscription data um, journals do allow you to load something, but understanding what exactly it is you are allowed to do and not allowed to do would be really helpful um, clarification for most academics, I think. Um. Thanks, Spencer. Uh, there's a question here. I'm just going to take a question from Slido uh, from one of our uh, listeners today. Um, and while we've got Spencer there, it's about journal prestige. Uh, do, do the panellists think that the ranking system is inherently uh, discriminatory. Uh, there's some recent, recent research being published by Maker and Murga, and it's in the um, 
higher education research area that talks about how Western uh, hegemony uh, in published scholarship and how that it's hard, and we, uh, Maui touched on power, it's hard to get into the higher ranking journals and the, the lower ranking journals tend to be more diverse. Uh, so uh, what are the panel's views on um, the ranking system when it comes to academic publishing? I think um, really if, if you went through um, something like Saimago, um, that you would be very hard to find um, indigenous flavoured journals in high ranking places. I'm going to say they are there, but you have to go looking for them very, very carefully to see where they are. And, and I think that sort of shows that perhaps, you know, they are not um, being valued um, in that sort of academic framework that sort of makes those assessments um, and I think when you come back to it you, you have to look um, at who is making those assessments and you would have to say that they, they're not um, always going to be taking uh, the values um, and issues that uh, Indigenous peoples uh, value um, into account when they're doing these rankings so uh, the call it racist. Um, I don't like calling things racist, but I, I, I do think it's discriminatory. Probably, it, it's yeah. I guess I could speak from experience. Um, Co-editing a journal, so um, Professor Peter Anderson and I co-edit the International Journal of Critical Indigenous Studies, and just recently we've had that. Um, our application to be indexed by Scopus um, approved. Now, the journal has been around for a number of years and I, I'm just not sure that, I don't know the history, so I don't know if there have been previous attempts to, to get indexed through various organizations or if this is the first attempt. I've only been there since 2018. Um, so, so far with the help of um, Tracy, who are, is, is I saw her name here today. Um, she was able to give me, um, she manages many open access journals at um, QUT and she was able to give me sort of the ins and outs on what to do to prepare the journal to, to get indexed. So I guess having that insider knowledge was quite helpful for, uh, for me to progress the journal in that way. Um, but I certainly agree with what you were saying, Spencer, around it's, it's really hard when you're doing research um, with Indigenous people about Indigenous matters to find the higher ranking journals that are interested in, in the, the content. Um, personally, I, I think maybe because I'm still in a junior role, I just look for journals that I, I, I think the, what I'm working on fits well and I don't, I don't worry too much about the, the ranking. I do work with other colleagues who are in more senior roles and I think maybe they have to lead by example. And really, if they're telling their, their staff, you must publish in an A star or Q1 or, or whatever, then um, that's the example they're trying to lead to. Um, so it's, it's a bit difficult, I'd say. Um, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> no, just, just absolutely i mean i, I don't know that it really is so you know um so i think that's the thing there's there's all sorts of um uh, aspects judgment calls that are made by certain people around almost every stage of uh this this kind of space you know whether or not you get funded for research is being assessed by people who've got particular ideas about what good is and what isn't often related to disciplinary kind of um, disciplinary expectations or uh, and and then when you, you're trying to sort of layer those things against um, what you would say is these things are of interest or of value to um, indigenous audiences or indigenous communities then they you know you get a divergence straight away and that's just kind of reflected in a whole bunch of places and I think the um, uh, the ways in which uh, 
uh, uh, I guess, you know, manuscripts are reviewed as kind of subject to the same sort of thing. And um, those pressures, you know, feed in both ways, um, both in trying to get into uh, a journal which you think is relevant, um, while you're also working in a context where there's pressures on you kind of pushing you into other places. It's just, it's, I'm not, I'm, I don't know how that gets fixed. Is, I mean, we talk a lot about real world impact and the academic publishing model seems to go against that when really the research is, is for the communities, with the communities, and it's how, how we give it back to the communities, that reciprocity and uh, collective good thing that um, Levon touched on, touched on before and others have touched on. And I find that really interesting, the sort of the, almost the conflict between our you know, traditional model of publishing and you know, how we have real world impact, like those pressures. Anyway, it's a, it's a very interesting conversation. Um, we've, we did touch on data, talking about data and what what would really be good to get a sense of and there's a question from um, Richard White about some of the work that Maui has been doing around data sovereignty I just I can't find it in Slido I saw it here there we go uh, so the indigenous licenses project it would be great if you could talk, touch on that a bit while we've got you here Maui uh, yeah so um I guess this is, you know, this is born out of these these sorts of challenges we've already talked about around um, reuse of reuse of information. So, you know, I, I I support open scholarship. I think open scholarship is a great thing in the context of um, that the information which you've agreed can go out uh, goes out. Now, there's still there's still a question there, even if you're making um, information available, whether it's through journal publications or or just kind of open data sets. Um, the degree to which that just means that any next user should be able to use it without engaging in some way with that community. So does the responsibility for the use of that information only lie with the person that generates it, or does it also lie with other users? And that's, um, and I think the open, uh, that's been part of the challenge around uh, sort of open access to data sets is that there's often no expectation of that, um, partly because you may not need to get ethics approval to make use of that data. And so you don't have a, a, some other kind of process encouraging you to you know, engage. So what we've been trying to work on is um, a project using uh, essentially digital tags that sit in the metadata, which can communicate the protocols, which might have been discussed between the kind of the collector of the information and the community directly, and can sit alongside and let next users know what um, what kind of appropriate things have been permissioned for, or where people are expecting um, you know recontact to happen. And those um, they had, so that's um, you know what we've been developed in relation to traditional knowledge labels, and we're trying to set that up. People can look for it. I see in the in the the text there around localcontext.org. Um, that's an extra legal sort of intervention. So it's one that's just trying to um, ensure that protocols are being shared amongst this sort of community of users of knowledge. Uh, we have been thinking about um, possibilities of creating licenses using, using that as well. One of the challenges around generating licenses is that you have to have the copyright in the first place. And the reason um, researchers or institutions can put in place a Creative Commons license is because they've already assumed that they, they've already claimed or assumed that they're the copyright holders for the material. And so there's that sort of step there, which is, you know, how do you get in a position where you can negotiate that with communities? And, you know, some projects will be more suited to that than others. And then in other places where it isn't, what other sorts of tools or mechanisms just help to maintain some of the cultural authority or the control that those communities are looking like as that sort of knowledge moves its way further and further through, you know, kind of the data ecosystem. Yeah, 
Kim, um, you're on you're on mute. Um, Thank you for that. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to add something if there's time, but I'll be guided yeah. by you. Yeah. No, go for it. Okay. Um, I just wonder if it's worth just having a little chat about Indigenous knowledge and what it is. And just because you're perhaps um, working with Indigenous people, knowing that that does not necessarily mean that you are then working with Indigenous knowledge. So if I can use examples from my research, I'm really exploring the needs and experiences with Indigenous people encountering certain types of experiences. So whether that's financial education or higher degree research studies. When I look then at um, what Terry Janke writes about what Indigenous knowledges are, it's, it's very clear around Indigenous knowledges or traditional knowledge um, deals with, say, agricultural knowledge or medicinal knowledge or um, certain types of technical knowledge lots of different categories um, represented there. And although the research that I'm doing is making a contribution to knowledge, it's not producing indigenous knowledge. So I guess I've just found dealing with um, ethics um, areas that sometimes there's an assumption that because you're, you're working with indigenous people, it's always then connected to creating indigenous knowledges. And so I guess there just needs, so, so there's some, sometimes a little bit of this, um, you know, internal, not battling back and forth, really trying to explain the circumstances and what's taking place because um, that just essentially highlights what we were speaking about before, how you, you can't kind of homogenize um, research practices with Indigenous people and Indigenous communities. So I just wanted to mention that. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Spencer, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, it's it's an interesting um, point around um, what is indigenous knowledge and how do you create indigenous knowledge, or is it is it knowledge that's already created? And uh, I guess it, it it very much depends on the knowledge system that you're working with. I guess as to how people interpret that. Um, I, I've heard. Um, Helene Moku me talk about um, people practicing Mātauranga Māori by just doing a haka, and and he you know makes the point that you know so that it's it's a knowledge system that is growing, and so that the way that we had thought about it traditionally and how it related to the traditional um, world um, is being adapted into the modern and futuristic world. And so perhaps some of the stuff that Levon was talking about will be part of an indigenous knowledge system in, in the future. And it's, I, I guess it's those sorts of philosophical discussions that um, people like um, Crucial uh, Watani and um, Georgina to Ari um, Stewart, you know, so that, you know, their work around what is Maori philosophy um, is helpful in that sense, yeah. I'll just add a little bit to the, um, there's been sort of really, uh, the, I think the Indigenous data sovereignty movement has also been pushing uh, a sort of an expanded view. Um, so there've been the conversations about uh, uh, responsibility in relation, you know, your research relationships around sort of traditional knowledge, whether that's associated with genetic resources and, you know, kind of the Nagoya protocol type space or whether it was just in terms of cultural heritage items. But the, um, I think there's also a notion that uh, information that's being generated that's of value to those communities, even if it's, you know, separate, distinct from traditional knowledge. It's arising from administrative data or other things. There's a space for a discussion, and I think you know the um, you know the Iwi tribes here are saying you know we want to be involved in conversations about data access and data governance in relation to those things as well as our um, traditional knowledge, and that's um, I think that's the place where there is. You know, there's still you know there's no kind of settled position around what that looks like. But there's a, a clear indication that they want to be having those discussions. Fantastic. Uh, 
so, I mean, we've sort of moved into this domain of talking about data um, and data sovereignty. What about IP in relationship to uh, this space and to data sovereignty? Um, how does that relate? Is there is there um, a a way that it can be adapted for communities so they can uh, deal with the IP issues around uh, indigenous knowledges? I I think one of the problems around intellectual property really is that there is very little protection. For indigenous peoples as it is um, and so you have to be very careful negotiating the space as to um, what you do put out into the public domain is not diminishing those rights even more um, until the, sort of the, the intellectual property framework um, recognizes um, indigenous knowledge in a uh, um, in a legal sense that um, protects it um, more so from um, people exploiting it. Um, I think you know we're we're in a very um, tense sort of area um, for, and um, I think with uh, this being an area that is being looked at in greater detail at the moment, um, with uh, through the um, Indigenous flora and fauna claim here in New Zealand um, and the sort of uh, resolution that sort of the current government is trying to give to that. Um, I think there's a lot of um, discussion still to go on in this space in New Zealand. And I think very much um, places like um, the World Intellectual Property Office and that probably watch us with interest and will, you know, what happens here may have some influence in other places around the world as well, so. Yeah, so if I, if I just kind of kick in, I think there's a, um, there's a whole range of, I think there's, I think we have to become better at uh, looking at the range of protections that are possible. So when we're talking about indigenous data sovereignty, we're talking about, you know, enhancing indigenous control of indigenous data. That's not just ownership. You know, ownership is one thing that contributes to that. But, you know, there are places where that won't be possible for a whole kind of variety of reasons. And so being able to look at what are the other ways, what are those other points where that comes about? And I think, you know, legal protections is one thing, but we already acknowledged the you know, uh, challenges with not being able to get protections for um, the traditional knowledge itself. Um, you know, South Africa has a Indigenous Knowledge Act. I know here in Aotearoa, they, they think they're talking about it. They're talking about, you know, is something possible? But, you know, in the absence of that, you know, you don't have anything. But you can still think about, um, like, technical solutions. And often those technical solutions are just... Uh, uh, things you know, you're either making a decision not to put stuff in a public place or you're putting it in more of a controlled access space where it's a by request rather than than something else and you know libraries have done that for you know rare books in the past or, or, or other ways and just trying to think about how some of those models can translate into a sort of a digital a digital environment now um, certainly um, you know our work with the labels is trying to create a protection through transparency so by making transparent the indigenous interests associated with the material and also some of the expectations around reuse, then um, it becomes clear to everyone what it's supposed to be. You can't make people do it, but at least, you know, then you sort of have this kind of moral thing. You know, we certainly thinking about the way in which you could have an interaction between uh, that indication and sort of a technical solution. So if you had a seasonal label which says, you shouldn't be singing this song at this time of the year, then um, the library could switch off access for those, you know, for that season and then enable it. Now, I don't think we're there, but, you know, it's, it's sort of that kind of thing that then makes, um, gives you a, a, a greater way of just thinking about control across all of the different places where that can come about. Fantastic. Um, it would be nice to be there soon um, in terms of you know, helping us all out in that space.
Um, one of the questions that I'm interested in is uh, the use of Creative Commons licenses and whether that is something that uh, I guess Indigenous researchers embrace for the sharing of uh, research and data and their reports in terms of getting um, increasing access um, sort of more internationally and if it's something that you think about uh, in your roles. Um, so we might throw it open to the panel. I think it's... Um... Probably not on everyone's radar. Um, so if, I think you know that's that's it's sort of raising the consciousness of people about the possibilities again. And then this this is possibly where you know the Creative Commons champions come back into their um, own. And you know if they're in the library, that's that's great. Or in the, another part of um, the research institution. Um, and so I think I think you know there's a lot of work to be done in sort of just raising you know the the awareness of the general academic sort of um, population. We're, we're we're smart people, but we're not <laughs> yeah we're not always the smartest in in the way that we operate. You know, so that's right. But if we're told it's important, say for getting the journal indexed by Scopus, we make sure it's done. So my involvement has, has um, been just ensuring that the, um, the articles that have been published with the journal, that the Creative Commons license sits with the authors because that is um, one of the requirements of, of Scopus. So that's basically the, the extent of my experience um, thinking about Creative Commons, but yeah. I agree with what you're saying, Spencer. Just let us know if, if there's something we should be thinking about. We'll definitely consider it, especially if we can see, you know, what the advantages are. So, and, and this, you know, this, I think this is an interesting point because, um, so to get the the journal on Scopus, you need to have user Creative Commons. So you have these sort of systems which the um, criteria around using them propagates propagates the use of particular tools. Now, I mean, I quite like, I quite like Creative Commons. And, and if you think about Creative Commons, they've got a sort of a variety of different sorts of licenses, which allow you to essentially make things open, but not fully open all the time. It's sort of, you know, allow say, okay, like this, but with, um, you know, without commercial things or I forget all the, all the parts. But I think that's the sort of thing which we're also then being trying to translate from an indigenous point of view. And so what I, you know, what I'd like to see with Creative Commons is how do they get into the position where they can start um, disclosing indigenous interests that are associated with the material? Because at the moment, the material, like the, the licenses from the researcher, you know, they're the ones that are, are, are allowing in it. So it directs things back to them rather than maybe the community that they were working with or providing some sort of acknowledgement of the interests that sit in and around that. So if there was something that could deal with both the, um, the interests of the researcher, which I think the system, you know, is designed to help kind of maintain, but then also the interest of the community, um, that would be a nice place to get towards. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we have about five minutes left, and I'm just thinking what I might do is give you all the opportunity to uh, say the one thing you really wanted to say with all these amazing people here um, about principle and ethics. And that could be something you want people to go away and look at, something you want us to consider, and then uh, perhaps if we think out another five years in terms of principles and ethics or data sovereignty, where would you like higher education to be in terms of um, the space or how far along we've progressed? So we might uh, start with uh, Libon. Thank you. Um, well, going back to what I, where I first started, I'd love to see the number of Indigenous academics and Indigenous HDR students increasing, um, certainly by 2025. And also, I think 
um, it's the research is about really thinking about what else can be left behind. So uh, an elder I was working with said to me, you know, only take what you need and leave the rest. And so I often reflect on that statement and have been able to put in, into place with one of the projects that I did with um, young people. Um, and, and what that involved was actually just leaving the balance of unused funds with the youth, youth group I was working with. Um, and, and also thinking about how you can involve Indigenous participants in other ways other than just being participants. And again, for me, that came about by being able to employ one of the young um, people during their summer, um, summer break to do some research experience. So connected again to the benefits of research, who really is benefiting and looking to see how you can ensure that it's not just you that is benefiting through the research. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, I'll go next. <laughs> so, um, I guess one of the things that I really wanted to think about um, in the session was, um, publicly funded research should it always be open. And um, I, I, I would sort of argue that if you're being, particularly if you are receiving money from a competitive external research um, source, that it probably should be as open as possible. Um, and that may also include the, the data that you collect as well. Although, in saying that, I'm also conscious of the fact that in our institutions, we have to go through quite a um, rigorous uh, human ethics process, which typically um, sort of looks at what is going to happen to your data, where is it going to be stored, how, who is going to access it. And I think there's a lot of issues that we have to look at around that and, and in line with some of the things that Maui has been um, saying today. Um, there, there are some sort of um, sort of roadblocks, I think, to sort of getting sort of everything out into the open, um, including some of the issues I talked about earlier um, about sort of getting into sort of um, positions where we are able to promote Indigenous scholarship at the highest levels and sort of um, have an impact on those journals that typically have not had um, indigenous content included. Um, so it's sort of indigenizing those journals rather than um, sort of just being a token appearance. Thank you, Spencer. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm just trying, just trying to um, sort of think how I kind of in, enter the thing that I want to say, which is so I think the, the the challenge here for this community is, and you know, a lot of people have a responsibility for um, managing knowledge, storing data, and making sure that it's available, and kind of facilitating that process. Now, there's there is value that emerges from that, and there is support for that um, that being an outcome. But I think we just we just do have to be really thoughtful about the fact that just because you make data open doesn't mean it's accessible to everyone. And often, and particularly in sort of the new age with AI and, and everything else, it's, it's actually uh, uh, helps to continually accrue value towards those with the technical skills and resources. And that um, is seen by a number of communities as a, just a different form of um, extracting resources, you know, rather than being kind of lands and trees and resources from um, resource, you know, kind of physical resource that now becomes this kind of cultural resource that is being taken from these, taken from these communities. And so as, um, as you're creating the infrastructures that uh, allow this to happen, which can be, um, can have a kind of a utopian vision or a dystopian vision, um, what are the things that you can put in place that make sure it heads more to the utopian side? And I think, um, ensuring that there's opportunities for um, Indigenous communities to be recognised through the system. So the only point of recognition isn't just a collection part, but that can be reaffirmed at different places, allows them to become participants in those, those sort of next activities. So 
you know, maintaining provenance, um, creating spaces for disclosures of interest, trying to think about um, uh, where those rights can be represented in different, in different ways and how that can be propagated through systems is going to be key to ensuring that there's some equity that comes out of this, um, out of this activity. Um, so that's what I wanted to say. Kia ora. Kia ora. Uh, I'd like to thank all the panel for their, uh, their wisdom, their knowledge and experience and sharing it with us today. Um, there are quite a few questions in Slido that we just didn't get the opportunity to address. So we'll see what we can do about some of those. Uh, it has been uh, an absolute pleasure to be in your company. And uh, I, uh, I feel so privileged to have shared this space and time with you all. And thank you to all the participants for uh, coming along today. Uh, I, I really feel that uh, we're at a, a particular time uh, in uh, the sector uh, where these conversations are coming through more often and that uh, there's an opportunity to talk uh, more openly uh, about some of the challenges in this space and some of the great things that come out of open access as well uh, for uh, Indigenous communities and Indigenous researchers. So namahi nui kia koutou katoa and I'll hand back to Thomas. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. So Definitely thank you again to, to Kim, Maui, Levon, and Spencer for such a great discussion. Um, as I mentioned, the recording of this will be available to disseminate um, next week on the OA Australasia website. Um, and lastly, I want to note that there are two final sessions tomorrow, one looking at the relevance of open education resources to, to both the, the person in the teaching role and the person in the student role. Um, and a second one at communicating complex topics to non-specialist audiences. So thank you again for today, and I hope to see you all again soon.